if our families have any hope, people must know Jesus. This is what we must experience. The time is coming on this earth where you will have to stand. Days of our probation are fast closing. The end is near. To us, the warning is given. Take heed to yourself. Father in heaven, we thank you for allowing us to have the opportunity to come before your throne. And we know that as we bow before you in prayer, that our Savior and our brother, Jesus Christ, gives us access to your immediate presence and speaks for us. And we know that you always hear him and that you love his voice. We pray that we would grow to love the voice of Jesus more and that we would follow more closely the promptings of the Holy Spirit as we are led moment by moment and day by day. We're thankful, Lord, for the protection that you've allowed us to receive over this holiday season. And what a privilege it is to be here tonight when in reality we know that man calculates that some who have absolutely no intention to meet death they meet it without a moment's warning because of carelessness and accidents. But you protected us. And I have to admit, Lord, that sometimes I don't think about it, but we all really know that you have taken an interest in us tonight. So we want to thank you, and we want to assure you that we do love you and that we do appreciate, even though we are rebellious and, and often we do our own thing. We do appreciate what Jesus Christ has done for us and what he is doing even now tonight. And we do desire to surrender to him and to be more cooperative. But our hearts, Lord, they're so wicked. Our minds are so prone to enjoy that which is contrary to eternal life. So tonight as we begin, give us a new heart and a new mind. Work with a new mind tonight and give us power. Pour out your Holy Spirit. We pray that as your Holy Spirit is poured out into this room, into this humble meeting place, that every unclean spirit will be removed. That every sin that has ever trapped us or captivated our minds would be seen in its clarity. And that we would allow you to purge us and cleanse us and wash us. We want to be made whole. Tonight, you can do this for us. Speak through your word like never before. And convert our hearts anew. In Jesus' holy name, we pray, amen, amen. As we prepare to go to Revelation chapter 1, I just want to stop by the book of John for a moment because often in our Christian experience 
In our Christian experience, sometimes God does not allow us to really see what He is doing in our lives. And I remember so often, especially when I had the easy battles. And what I call the easy battles were the battles that were clearly seen. The environmental battles. The battles that if push came to shove, all God would have to do is place you in a particular circumstance and you couldn't commit that particular sin. And I remember how tough I thought fighting the cigarette habit was and fighting the alcohol habit and the cocaine habit and the PCP or Sherman and angel dust habit. And I can remember going home sometimes and I would wrestle with God under the influence of these drugs and I know that God would listen and often I would hear him speak back. And I would wonder and one of the things that I would ask God and I would question him about is I would say, Lord, am I going to change? I mean, please help me. But what I didn't realize, what I didn't realize was that the work of God is such a mighty work and it's so contrary to the devisings and the way man would do it that often God is doing the most important work while you're focusing on something totally different. And I say that because I know that if you ever want to know why it's so important to come to these meetings night after night and sometimes you may stand at the end and with all your heart, you say yes to God. God heard that yes. He chronicled that yes in a book with his own blood, with his own finger. And whether you realize it or not, more transpired in the securing and the settling you into eternal life than your mind could even comprehend. And the Bible here in John says it this way. The Bible says in John there was, Lord, we pray for you to bless your word. We're thankful from the onset that your presence, your Holy Ghost is in this room. But we want more of your presence, and we know the only reason why you can't come in your fullness is because we are not pure enough to receive you. Hide us in Christ so nothing can stop us from receiving the full outpouring of your Holy Spirit. For certainly Christ can stand under the pressure of your majesty, dear Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Bible says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? I'm in John 3, verse 4. John 3, verse 4. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And as silly as that may sound, this brilliant man was sincere. He said, how? Do I have to go find my mother and try to go back inside her? And Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. And then he said, the wind bloweth where it listeth. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is what? Born of the Spirit. And so here God describes what he is doing in your life. He describes what's going on behind the scenes. He says, the wind blows, and you may hear it, 
But you don't know where it came from. You don't know where it ended up. You don't know where it went. But you see the results. And often, especially if you live in Southern California long enough, when those Santa Ana winds come through, they don't knock down every fence. They don't knock down every tree. They don't wipe out every branch. But clearly you see the results of that wind. And brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit is doing a work on your life when you come to these meetings. And you don't know where he's beginning and you don't know where it's ending up. But one night, and it could be the night that you miss, the Lord will have that final work, that final move, that final blow, that one that will open you up. And you say, well, why won't he do it tonight? He's moving us in a position so we can be prepared. You have to understand in the book of Hebrews. Notice what it says here in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. Notice what the Bible says, and I'm going to go into the sermon in a moment, but, but, but I want you to know that your coming is not in vain. And as I was praying tonight, the Lord said to me, I'm doing a work on the people of God. But God doesn't do a temporary work. And God doesn't warranty some for one year. You could spend $2,000, $3,000 on a computer, and after a year, I don't care what goes wrong. Unless you buy an extended warranty. Well, God says, you don't need an extended warranty on me. When I fix the thing, it will be fixed. But I need you to cooperate. And don't second guess me. This is a faith journey. By faith, believe that God is doing something for us and through us and in us. He's doing it, brothers and sisters. Notice what it says here in the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. The Bible says in verse 37, For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and what? Will not tarry. Are we there? Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with verse 37. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. And then it says, Now the just shall live by what? By faith. And what is faith? Faith is believing in the Word of God only and believing that the Word of God will accomplish what it says it would do by itself. Faith is not something that you see. Faith is something, brothers and sisters, that you have to hope for and trust in. For if you could see it, it's not faith. It's fact. And the Bible says the just shall live by faith. And you must believe that according to, the, to, to Isaiah 55, and notice what it says. Hold your thumb there on Hebrews with me and go to Isaiah 55. I'm telling you, Jesus is working a work. It's a serious work. Notice what it says in Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. Notice what the Bible says in Isaiah 55. Jesus is about to come, brothers and sisters, and he's moving swiftly. And believe it or not, he has advanced his presence in your life more than you know it. And some of the things that, that the devil seems to just keep beating you down with, and you keep turning to God saying, oh, Lord, I've done it again. The Lord's not paying attention to that. He's doing an unseen work that if you saw the problem, you would not have confidence that it could be fixed. Some of our deficiencies, God can't even show us until after we get the victory. Because it would overwhelm us. We would look and say, it's impossible. And God doesn't want us to be overwhelmed. And this is why he doesn't allow the powers of darkness to even reveal themselves or even to present themselves with all their forcefulness upon us where we can feel it. Every blow that the devil throws has to go through Christ. Whatever we do feel has been cushioned, and that's why we should never murmur or we should never complain. The prophet of the Lord says that God encircles his children. And when the devil throws that blow, Christ takes the blow, and sometimes he'll just let you know that you're in the battle so that you'll watch and pray like he asks us to do. The Bible says in Isaiah 55, notice what it says. For my thoughts in verse 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, 
so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth, bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be, that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void. Something's going to happen, it says. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish, but, but, it, but, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. And remember those who were here that night, we interchanged the word it with the word. And we read it this way. We said very clearly, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. The word shall not return unto me void, but the word shall accomplish that which I please, and the word shall prosper in the thing whereto I send the word. It's all about the power of the word. But the key is the text before it. It says you have to be like the ground. You have to place yourself where the word can constantly reign upon you. You have to read it. You have to hear it. And when God's church opens, be there. Because the promise is that God's going to do what he wants. He's not going to do what you want. Oh, Lord, free me from this bill. Oh, God, free me from the No, no, no. The Lord is doing what he knows to do best. He created us. Who knows what part of the body he created first? We don't know. But he knew which order to go in. And in the recreation of our hearts and the restructuring of our lives so that we might be found worthy to obtain eternal life, we have to have confidence that God knows and that he's working on us and that he's doing a great work for us and placing us in a position. Now, why it is that God won't show us everything and why it is sometimes that you agonize over certain things and just seems like you're not going anywhere. Why, Lord? Why are you doing this work this way? Because God's work is a final work. Notice what it says back in Hebrews again. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. The Bible says, For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Then it says, Now the just shall live by faith. Faith in what? The word of God. Remember? Remember? So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. The word shall accomplish that which I please, and the word will prosper whereto I send the word. So it says the just, this is how they live. They don't live based on sight. They live by the word. So if something overcomes me, and I find myself having to confess to God, I point at God, and I say, Lord, I trust your word, and I know that you're not going to leave me out here hanging. No matter what the situation looks like, I must believe that the end result is going to rest with God's approval because I'm placing myself in an environment where I, can be, where, where, where I can absorb the word of the living God. And the word of God's promise is what? That he's going to accomplish what he pleases. Now, brothers and sisters, God didn't come that you would die. The Bible says, I came that you might have life. The Bible says he is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all might repent. So if that's God's desire, then the word must accomplish that in me unless I draw back. Notice what the Bible continues to say here. The Bible says, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Then it says, now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back. My soul shall have no pleasure in him. Luke 9, 64 puts it this way. I mean, 9, 62. No man putting his hand to the plow and looking back. So God is trying to do a final work on us. So don't doubt. What is our job? Our job is verse 6 of Isaiah 55. Verse 6 said, prior to God saying that his word will accomplish what he pleases, verse 6 said, our job is to seek the Lord while he may be found, to call upon him while he is near. near. Why? Because the time's going to come where we're not going to have these privileges. We're not going to have these opportunities. And so we need to place ourselves in the position believing God and believing his word 
and knowing that the Lord is not going to lose. Why? Because he cannot lose. He cannot lose. Our job is to study. Our job is to pray. And our job is to hold God to his own promises. You know, the Lord, if you want to make him smile, catch him in a situation where it seems like things aren't going according to his word and look at him and put his word on him. Jesus loves the word. Why? Because the word is Jesus. That's him. Try him. And I challenge you, and that's why, brothers and sisters, if you have children at home that live in your house, when you come to the meetings, guess what? They need to be coming to the meetings with you. What if my mother would not have forced me to go to church? I didn't like church. I hated church. I didn't want to be in church. I didn't have anything to do with church. And when I got old enough to sit by myself, I would wait until everybody got going real good, and I would sneak out. I can remember I would cross the street and go to the library and meet two or three other young fellas there, and we would look at magazines and play and play around. We'd look at the clock because it was pretty predictable, the church I grew up in. We knew what time they were going to end. And at that certain time, we'd start sneaking back across the street. And my mother would always ask us going home, what was the sermon about? But see, I was smart. I would go to somebody older, and I'd say, what did you get from that message? And they would say, well, you know, when the pastor said, and I say, oh, wow. And they go, wow, you know, little Stevie, wow, you, 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 you interested in the word of God. And then I wait for my mother in the car. Well, what'd you get out of it? And I said, well, you know, when the pastor said, brothers and sisters, I hated church. What if my mother would not have made me be there where it would be poured into my brain? There would have been no hook. There would have been nowhere for God to catch. And this is why I'm telling you, if indeed these are the last days, and I know they are, if indeed the Bible is true, and we're going to see this week in clarity, if it's true and we believe it, then the time's going to come where the freedom that we now have to teach the Bible in its pureness, unobstructed, it's going to end. Christians are not always going to be able to have this freedom. As a matter of fact, Revelation 13 puts it this way. Revelation chapter 13. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says the time is going to come where our experience is going to have to be so great that we are willing to put our lives on the line. Listen to what it says here. And this week, this week coming up, I believe Tuesday night, I'm going to explain this chapter. I'm going to deal with the mark of the beast. I might. I'm wrestling with some subjects because of my schedule, so, 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 so don't hold me to it. But I want to teach you some things. But listen to what it says here. The Bible says very clearly, beginning with verse 16, and he calls it, this is the beast power, and he calls it all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, brothers and sisters, this whole battle in Revelation 13 is about worship, freedom of worship. Because if you notice, brothers and sisters, listen to what it says in verse 4. The, I mean, in, 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 in verse 4, it says, And they worship the dragon. And we know, according to chapter 12, verse 9, that the dragon is the devil. And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And then we drop down to verse 15 and 16 and 17, and it says, Listen, the time's going to come where your freedom of worship is going to end. And you're going to need an experience with God that we don't now have. And many are too indolent to obtain. And so this is why we need to sacrifice everything to be found where the Word of God is being taught. And we need to compel as many people. Why? Because the more people we expose, the more people will be on our side when it goes down. And it's going down. Why? Because the Word of God said it. As a matter of fact, if I explain this chapter to you tonight, some of you would tremble because it's already happening. And I mean, brothers and sisters, it's happening so clear. 
And there are people in this room who have heard it before and they know it's happening and they're still relaxed. They're still caught up in other activities almost as though it's fictitious. This is not a movie. This is real. The prophetic hand of God is almost at an end. Every prophecy in the Bible. We saw it the other night. We saw it Tuesday night. They've been fulfilled, brothers and sisters. The next movement can happen even as we are in this worship service. Have mercy. Can you imagine? The Bible says multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. The Lord cometh in the valley of decision. In other words, people are going to be making decisions as to whether they should follow God. I can imagine that everybody wasn't quite aware that the door of the ark had closed. Everybody wasn't aware. And I can imagine that someone that night possibly left the ark after Noah had preached the most startling sermon. And I can imagine they could hear in their ears the resounding tone of that hammer hitting that gopher wood as Noah would preach with every blow he struck into the side of that ark. And I could imagine on the way home they were deciding and wondering, you know what? I wonder if I should really follow that Noah. They went to bed with it on their mind. And as they were thinking about it, somebody came and said, man, did you hear what happened? What happened? Turn your TV on. Turn your TV on. We think we're something with these flat screen plasma TVs. I, I, I could only imagine how nice the televisions must have been in Noah's day. I mean, think about it. Sony has to build on another man's ideas to get to where they are. One man, 900 years, would have perfected that television. It would have been so nice. Turn your TV on. Man, what is that? Is that what angels look like? And the old man that woke him up said, Buddy, that is a real angel. He said, Remember we used to tell you how that angel used to stand at the garden? Because the Garden of Eden was on earth for years. The Garden of Eden was on earth for years. And every Sabbath, Adam and Eve, they would go to the garden with their children and they would use it as an object lesson to the obedience that they should have and what they had forfeited. And they will be able to look in and get somewhat of a, of, of a visual of what they gave up and what they would lose out on eternally. They would be able to stand in lofty areas and position themselves and they could see the tree of life. And they would preach these object lessons, but at some point God took it. And now the next angel they saw was that angel that closed the door of the ark. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, that brother who was going to make a decision, it was too late. See, everybody who had not died prior to the door closing was lost. See, many built the ark, many helped. And, and, and over the 120 years that Noah preached and preached and preached, there were many who believed and would have got on board, but they died prior. And this is the process of life where we are tonight. This is where we are right now. This is why you're seeing more and more older people who love the Lord. They're, 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 they're being whisked away into sleep, awaiting the first resurrection of God when the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ will rise. And there are others just dying without a moment's warning. Babies dying. I buried a baby. Matter of fact, three babies this year. And, and it startled me. Why? Because I read where an angel is going to lift these babies up and they're going to take these precious babies to, the, to their mother's arms in the resurrection, but I also read that many of the mothers wouldn't be there, but the baby would. And the angels would take the baby to the feet of Jesus and they would be raised by Christ in heaven. Babies are being laid down to sleep. The Bible says... Very clearly in Isaiah, notice what it says in Isaiah chapter 57. Listen, Jesus is about to come, and, and we have to readjust our attitudes if we plan to be saved. Notice what it says in Isaiah. Isaiah 57. Verse 
Isaiah 57, beginning with verse 1. If you're there, let me hear you say amen. The Bible says, are we there? The Bible says, the righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart. And merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. God is allowing people to die because he knows that they can't bear what's about to hit this world. And the Lord isn't concerned with our hurt feelings and our broken hearts because our children or our parents or our babies die. He's not concerned with that. He says, I am the resurrection. That's why he says to us in, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, go with me there, brothers and sisters. This is why he says to us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he gives us a command. It is not an option. It's a command. I'm telling you, we can trust the word of God. Listen, the Lord is trying to tell us tonight that we need to be converted and we need to get our minds focused and stay focused and stop letting every little wind of doctrine blow us this way and that way and stop us from coming to these meetings. I mean, the devil, when these meetings started, everything started going wrong. And all of a sudden, people who would have been here every single night start finding places that they had to be more important. Your salvation is first, and everything else is secondary. The devil started throwing every reason, every excuse, because this is the meeting that one night the power of God's going to fall so heavily. I can't tell you when, but I'm telling you something's going to happen and it's going to be just like when the door shut. You're going to say, what? You're going to see the glow. You're going to see the difference. And you're going to run in and beg to buy the oil. But it won't be there for you. I'm not making this up. You get the previous crusades on tape. And you play one. And then you play this one. And you see, has, you see whether or not God has not elevated things. To a whole nother level. A whole nother level. I'm telling you. Because this is it, brothers and sisters. This is it. There are people in this room who need to really have their house in order because they're going to die. It's the only way God can save you. Or he sees that you're not going to do anything except continue to accumulate more and more sins against your slate and he'll allow you to die because he'll see that you're just not going to get any better. And then others he will allow to live even though they're going to be lost because he needs your unclean character to develop and assist the characters of those who are really surrendering to God. You see, when you pray and say, Lord, please, Help me with my temper. Well, the first thing God does is gives you a little strength, and then he sends somebody by to agitate you. And then when that thing flares up, you say, oh, Lord, I'm still alive. And then finally, when you pass that test, because the test keeps coming, and it keeps coming until we pass. But the difference is, every time we fail, it's harder the next time because we never should fail. Even every night, everybody who takes the quiz passes the quiz by the bonus question. Jesus died for me. Will you live for him? Well, once you say yes, then every deficiency, every wrong answer, all of that is wiped out, and you live in Christ as though you never failed. That's why we end with that question every night. The quiz isn't about who's smart and who knows the Bible. It's about learning to trust in God and God alone. And Jesus is going to lay a lot of people down. He's going to lay some of us down. Maybe me. And let me tell you something. I will not be like Isaiah. Oh, God, please. Please. I mean, Hezekiah. When the prophet came and told Hezekiah, Hezekiah, God said, get your house in order. You are going to die. Hezekiah started talking about everything he did for God and said, oh, please, come on, let me live. That was the biggest mistake in the world because God answered that prayer. Brothers and sisters, God says, go. Oh, if he's, if I am close enough where I can hear his voice, I want to go. What happens to my children and my wife and the church, man, hey, let it be. 
I just want to be ready. If I get to live and look up and see Christ when he comes and be one of 144,000, praise God. But as long as I am saved, that's all I want. And I do realize the very text that I said earlier in Luke 9, 62, that no man putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for God. I realize that it's no once saved, always saved business. The Bible's clear. If the righteous man turns back to sin, the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 3 that all of his righteousness is forgotten. And he's a lost man. It's not how you start, the Bible says, but he that endureth until the end. And some of us, we're, we, 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 we're not pressing. We're not pressing. And if I told you everyone who really understood intellectually the role that George W. Bush has played to throw these prophecies into the open, and millions and millions, and you, I, you know what, I'm going to show you this week. Millions don't have a clue. This whole Christian movement, where the ecumenical, I mean, where, where, where the evangelical movement is putting politicians in, telling them to dictate, dictate religion. Brothers and sisters, they don't even realize what they are doing. They don't even have a clue that they are fulfilling prophecy. And many of them <laughs> will hasten the prophecies that will place Satan in the position to have authority on this earth to wipe out thousands and cause them to go to Christless graves and they will turn around and be saved. While some of us who kept becoming comfortable, how do we sleep so well at night without really knowing that our hearts are right with God? And again, this is why when we start seeing our loved ones die, this is why when we start seeing our children die, the Bible says here very clearly in 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning with verse 13, it's a command. Notice what it says. It says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are what? Which are asleep. That's some of our people who are dead. When you die, you don't go to heaven. When you die, you go to the grave. I spent a whole night teaching about that. You don't go to heaven when you die. I know it sounds good and people say, oh, you know, but absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where, uh, I mean, when you, when you read 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where it talks about being absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, it is not talking about when you die, you go to be with Christ. When Jesus died, he didn't even go to heaven. He told Mary, don't touch me. I have not gone to my father. If you look in Matthew 26, hold your thumb there in, in, in a, a moment. Hold your thumb and go to Matthew 26. And notice what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 26. <clears throat> Matthew 26. Notice what the Bible, I mean Matthew, yeah, Matthew 26. Or Matthew 27, I'm sorry. Notice what the Bible says when Jesus died, what took place. If you're there, let me hear you say amen. Now listen, you know, I have a sermon prepared, but the Lord is telling me to appeal. And I know the Holy Spirit speaking because some hearts right now have just heard what God wanted them to hear. And I, got, I have to follow God. I can't go on the prescribed plan. I'm not up here in my own armor. I'm telling you, there has not been one passage of Scripture that I have said tonight that I spent the three hours in the back this afternoon praying and studying over. I have not said one thing that I've been praying and wrestling over tonight. Not one scripture. The Lord is telling us we better get more serious about these meetings. We better get more serious about salvation. We better get more serious about making sure that our lives are secure that our families are secure. Because God will not take you to heaven if he can't trust you there. He cannot do it. You will ruin everything if there's anything in us 
that we have not willingly surrendered to God, we would ruin heaven. And guess what? You wouldn't want someone there. You know, it's an interesting thing. <clears throat> someone who was very close to me, I remember the home that they had. And I'm not slighting them in any way. And I don't want to say who it is. And they, I remember taking the kids to their home. And boy, the kids used to run through that house. And you'd hear big thumps and bangs and they wouldn't even turn. They wouldn't even look. They didn't care. Sometimes I, I can remember my wife calling the kids and hey, what are you doing? And, 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 and somebody would say, oh, don't worry about them. They're all right. Let them have fun. They would just have a ball. But they built a new home. Nice, beautiful, God blessed them. I mean, beautiful home, peace of God in the home. And when the children start playing now, all of a sudden now, hey, 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 stop that. Don't do that in here. Hey, what are they doing up there? You see, even when you look at it from an earthly standpoint, you wouldn't want someone in your brand new car acting the way you allowed them to act when you were rolling in your Volkswagen. You wouldn't want them acting the same way in your brand new home that you used to let them in your little bitty house that, you know, it was okay, but what can they really tear up? Would you really want someone in this room? Would you really want your mother to be in heaven the way she is now? Think about it. You don't even want to live with your mama now. Amen. Would you want your brother to be in heaven with you right now, the way they are? You see, this, this, this is why we have to really surrender to God. Because God can't take them for the safety of everybody. Do you know what, what it means to quarantine something? You get on a cruise ship and come up with a virus, they have a special room where they will put you in and lock you up. And they won't let you have access to any other parts of the ship because it's unsafe. And it may not be anything but a common cold if they think something's wrong. That's how heaven is. Jesus can't come and die again. Do you know? Now this may come to a shock to you. I'm writing the word finish line for those who can't see it. This is the finish line. Do you know that Jesus in his life made it right to the finish line? He didn't go any further. You know how the track stars, they run and they get to the finish line, they bend and they go further. Everything Jesus had barely got him here. It was not easy. If he would have lived one day more, we wouldn't have been saved. He was on a timeline period. Next Saturday night, I'm going to show you that from the Bible. Everything he did was precise, and it was on a timeline. He didn't stay. It, when, when, when Jesus cried, it is finished. It was exactly the ninth hour at that exact time. The curtain, the veil was rent in the, in the temple. The lamb that was about to be sacrificed jumped up off the table and ran free because the lamb that had been slain before the foundation of the world had said, it's finished. <clears throat> and I don't care how powerful the priest was and how weak that lamb was, when Christ said it is finished, the lamb, who normally would never respond, jumped up and got out of there. And the angel said, get out of here. You're not killing that lamb anymore. Christ put everything he had into it. When they went to give him that gall to drink when he said, I thirst, and he denied it, he understood that he was dealing with time. He understood. 
Man, I sip this stuff, and I might cry, it's finished. If, and, and the thief, if the thief would have waited five more minutes, he would have been eternally lost. Now, brothers and sisters, this is not a story for us to read. God is trying to show us our lives. You think you're not hanging up there dying? And every time we commit sin, we're cursing Jesus. Every time we commit sin, we're saying, come down from the cross. If you be the son of God, you see, that's what they were saying. They said, listen, if thou be the son of God, come down from the cross and save thyself and us. In other words, save us in our sins. But he wouldn't come down. And he's not going to save us in our sins, brothers and sisters. He's not going to do it. And so we're going to have to put forth more of our personal effort. And our effort is all God asks for. And what do we do? We put forth that effort in surrendering to him. How much strength does it take for you to pick up the Bible and open and start reading? It doesn't. That shows you how deep the spiritual battle is. Now, if we're going to make it, brothers and sisters, if we're going to make it, we're going to have to press. <clears throat> we're going to have to press. And notice what it says here, because I want to show you that when Jesus cried, it is finished. Notice what it says here. The Bible says, beginning with verse 45, Matthew, we're going back to 1 Thessalonians. But we're in Matthew 27, beginning with verse 35. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit, and I thank you for the fresh words that you are speaking to me right now. And if no one else listens, Lord, I beg you to help me to listen tonight. The Bible says in verse 45, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. In other words, for those three hours, the reason why it was darkness is because the Father had turned his back on Christ and blocked the Son. He, didn't, he couldn't stand to look on it and didn't want others to be able to see the suffering of his Son. From the sixth to the ninth hour, it was darkness. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lamach sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God. My God, he was talking to the Father. My God, to the Holy Ghost, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elias. And straight away, one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let be. Don't give him anything to alleviate his pain and his thirst. Leave him alone. Let us see whether Elias will come and save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom and the earth did quake and the rocks went and what happened and the graves were what open and many bodies of the saints came out of heaven is that right what's it say it says and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, brothers and sisters, these were saints. They didn't go to heaven. They were in the grave. They were asleep, and they were resting. And it was something about the cry of God in that cry that caused them to resurrect. And the reason why is because if there was ever time where this world was left without a faithful following of God, the world would cease to exist. And at that time, nobody was fully on the Lord's side. The disciples had run out on him. They didn't understand. He said, everybody's going to run. He had to tread that walk by himself, all alone. All alone. And by the way, do you know what could have saved him from doing it alone? One hour of prayer. One hour. 
He had begged the disciples. I mean, Jesus had so much confidence in three of them that he told them, come on with me, let the other ones just stay, the other nine, stay on down there. And he said, if you would just pray one hour with me. Sometimes if we would just spend time in prayer, and we'd have to worry about what you're talking about, Sometimes you just wonder, man, am I just being repetitious to God? Sometimes just be quiet. You don't know what takes place during that prayer. One hour, Jesus said, can you just spend one hour? I'm not asking you to pray the whole night. Spend one hour and then go to sleep. Just one hour with me in prayer. That's what he asked them, just one hour. And they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. They had lived and walked and watched Christ for three years and a half years and they understood the seriousness of his words but they had become so acquainted with the presence of the Holy Spirit in Christ that they took it for granted they had these experiences that we have and like us they went home and they didn't spend the hour if one of them would have spent one hour with Christ, it would have rewritten all of history and it would have caused Christ to have more strength to endure the cross. Can you imagine in a time when Jesus needed him most, Peter was on Satan's side. I mean, this is us. When we're not doing what God is asking us to do, and this is the hour when Christ needs us most. Probation is about to close. The same way Christ said, it is finished. Well, this time, Christ is going to say, it is finished, and probation is going to close on the church, on those who have had access to the truth. And when I say that, I'm not talking about any particular denomination right now. Oh, yes, it's going to close on God's remnant people, but... Every denomination that has had people who have been warned by God that this is the way, walk ye in it. Everybody who has really been warned, boom, it's going to shut down. And then, and that, you want Bible for it? Matthew 22 says the time's going to come when God's not going to try to reach church folk anymore. Look, go, go with me there a moment. We'll come back to 1 Thessalonians. Listen to what it says in Matthew 22. And while you're going to Matthew 22, I'm going to read a familiar passage to you in 1 Peter chapter 4. You're going to Matthew 22. Listen to what the Bible says, beginning with verse 17. The Bible says in verse 17, For the time has come, this is 1 Peter chapter 4. Write it down. As a matter of fact, hold your thumb there and go with me there. We'll come back to 1 Thessalonians if it be the will of God. Notice what it says, brothers and sisters, in 1 Peter. I want you to read it with me. And I know you've seen it before, but I want you to read it now. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning with verse 17. If you're there, let me hear you say amen. The Bible says, For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Now, brothers and sisters, that word house in the Greek, that word house in the Greek means any dwelling place. In other words, what it's saying is, brothers and sisters, it's talking about any dwelling place in the human body where ha that has ever had an experience with God. It's not just talking about a denomination. It's talking about anybody who has had, who, who has allowed the Holy Spirit to dwell in them. They've had an experience with God. And they know that this was God. It doesn't matter where they met him or how. Judgment begins with those who have had access to Christ first. Now, Matthew 22 says, notice what it says in Matthew 22. The Bible says in Matthew 22, Matthew 22, and when you get there, let me hear you say amen. In Matthew 22, the Bible says, 
In Matthew 22, beginning with verse 1, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Now, brothers and sisters, who were his servants? Remember, we spent the whole night talking about a servant. Those were people who yielded to Christ once. Those were, those were people who had access to the truth once. God said, listen, go and tell them to come. And notice what happens. It says, and they would not come. And again, he sent forth other servants, saying, tell them which are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat lean are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. And, but when the king heard thereof, he was angry, or he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies to destroy those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. God said, Look, go into the world now. And find everybody who will come. Now, brothers and sisters, there are some churches where there will be people who are considered in that church still in the world because they didn't have access to Christ. You know, in Matthew 23 where it says that there are certain people who, who profess to be Christians and they won't enter into Christ, they won't do what's right, and they get in the way and, and, and so distort the gospel that they stop other people from going in too. Well, God's going to give those people the opportunity. And the only ones that are in the church that will make it will be the ones that are the servants bidding others to come. That's the only group left. If the rest of the church becomes too consumed in the blessings that the Lord has allowed them to have on this earth, and they're too consumed with, with, with doing this and doing that, they're busy here and busy there, but they're not doing what God has asked them to do. And so God says, okay, you know what, that's all right. Go into the highways and byways. Go anywhere. Go into the hedges, one book of the Bible says. And bid them, compel them to come. Now, God is compelling us to come. He's asking us to come. And as I said before, as I said before, and you know it's interesting, this morning I prepared this handout, and the very title, the very title says more than more than we could chew. It says, surface religion, will it stand the test? And the answer is no. The answer is no. Before you read it, surface religion is not going to stand the test. So now what do we need to be doing? What do we need to be doing? Let me finish this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Heavenly Father, tonight I pray for the Holy Ghost to move us from our backsliding position. Bring us to the point where we first appreciated the taste, the sweet taste of the gospel. We have covered it with so many things tonight. Let us experience that first love. Please, help us, Lord. Breathe on us before it's too late. In Jesus' name we pray. The Bible says in verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. And then notice what the command says. What does the command say? That's a command. Let's read that together. It says that 
ye sorrow not. That's a command. He's not asking you. He's not telling you to come to a point. He says, listen, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep. What do you mean? In other words, what he's saying is when a person dies, they are much better off. They are asleep. They are waiting for the resurrection. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5 and 6 says, For the living know that they should die, but the dead know not anything. It says their memory is gone, their hatred's gone, their love is gone, their sleep in the grave. Psalm 146 says the exact same thing. Psalm 115 says the same thing. Job chapter 7 says the same thing. Job 14 says the same thing. Over and over in the Bible, it is duplicated and restated. Even Lazarus. Lazarus was not concerned. Lazarus had to come up out of the grave and then run for his life. The Bible says that after Jesus resurrected Lazarus, that they started looking for Lazarus to kill him because they didn't want people to know the miracle. So many people had seen Lazarus come forth and walk. They wanted to kill him so that he couldn't be a living testimony. He ran the rest of his life from the church. From the church. Lazarus didn't go to heaven. He went to the grave. He was stinking inside that tomb. The Bible's clear, and it says that ye sorrow not. In other words, you might cry because you miss a, per a person, but all this overwhelming grief and all this unnet. No, 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 no. You don't have to be sorry. Why? Because if they died and they're lost, reality says, why would you want them in heaven? All the fighting and all the agony and all the pressing that we're going through to make it to the kingdom, you want somebody up there that's going to ruin the kingdom of God and cause you to have to fight and have agony again? The only guarantee to the answer to God's promise when he says there'll be no more pain and no more suffering and no more sorrow, the only guarantee that guarantees that is that no more sinners or people who love sin can be there. We will never be robots. The only thing that's going to stop us from sinning in heaven is that we made a decision here on earth not to do it anymore. And when we are sealed in Christ, we're not going to do it. But everyone that has not made that decision, and this is why, brothers and sisters, we need to be careful and we need to be extremely prayerful when it comes to who we hang around and who we find comfort who we are you relax around do you know that jesus only relaxed at lazarus house that was where he relaxed around somebody mary magdalene martha and lazarus he could relax at their house he was really a friend that's why he talked so much about him it was something about the environment. But Jesus had to always somewhat, and he always had his guard up, but he couldn't relax everywhere. Some of us relax in places where people don't love God. With family. I'm telling you, if we don't learn to cut family off, I mean cut them off. If we don't learn how to cut off people, who don't love God. And some of us, and I'll tell you when you know you're outside of Christ, when you are more concerned, when you are more concerned with your sibling who you grew up with than you are with the next door neighbor who you've never witnessed to, you're not in Christ. Because when you move into Christ, you start loving everybody and you look at everybody as a candidate of heaven. And you don't go through all these extra expenses to try to win people who honestly tell you they don't want it. And they have access to it. Jesus was clear in Matthew 12, 44. Who is my mother? Who is my brother? Who are my sisters? And then he pointed to his disciples and said, those who serve my father, that's my family. Mary, his 
biological mama was standing outside when he was saying this and he never went outside to talk to her. Do, some of us don't believe that, do we? We don't believe that Jesus said anyone who loveth father or mother or sister or brother more than me is not worthy of the kingdom. We don't believe it. We say, oh, God doesn't really mean that. And we start putting all our energy because we are more tied to the earth than to Christ. When you are really tied to Christ, you start looking and your cry becomes the cry of Christ. And what does Christ's cry say? Christ's cry says, if any man, if any man will open the door. Doesn't matter to him. You'll get to heaven and be mad because some of your siblings aren't there. You will question God and his judgment. But if you would be faithful to God and you would really surrender to God and you would really do everything that God asks you to do, then just like Christ's family was saved, yours will be saved. Because the Bible says in 1 John, and whatsoever we ask, we receive because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. That's a promise we could take to the bank. So when I look at my brother and I offer him something and he doesn't move, then that offer is gone. I'm going to give it to somebody else. And I promise I prayed and I asked God years ago, Lord, help me. Because I read a statement in a book called The Great Controversy. I read it over 20 years ago when I was in college. And it said many other ways in which Satan uses to secure. In other words, not only to get you sidetracked, but the word secure. That means he has you to secure. And then uses the word and bind his captives. And then it went on to say, through silken cords of affection. Now, I was talking earlier tonight about that, and Pastor Dancy said that, that I preached a sermon titled Silken Cords of Affection. He said, everybody needs to hear that tape. Now, we don't have it here tonight, but you need to try to get your hand on one. Now, we'll bring it if you want, and I'm not trying to sell it for money. If you understood the traps that our families put us in, I mean, if you understood the way they, 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 they tie that rope around our feet in the name of my cousin and in the name of my auntie and in the name of my brother and my grandmother, brothers and sisters, listen. He says, many are the ways. Many. And then he says, through silken cords of affection. In other words, you, you, you disagree with everything about them, but, but because that's my husband, you stick around and you rationalize. Now, I'm not telling you you could get a divorce, but I'm telling you you shouldn't be anywhere where you can't serve God in peace. Anywhere. Do you realize that Adam did not fail God because of Satan it was because of who Satan used that should tell us something Eve begged Adam begged him begged him she didn't just go to him and say you know here Adam no 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 she pleaded with him, please, Adam, please, don't leave me. You see, we look at the picture. We look at the picture. Where, where's Pastor Dancy? Where, where is he? Is he in here? Man, he knows the word I'm looking for. He's, he, he, look, I, look when, Jesus, when Jesus needed him most, have mercy. Oh, Holy Spirit, give me that word. It's a word that the prophet uses, and it means, when you look it up, it means big yearned I mean she pleaded Adam please please Adam she didn't just walk up and Adam saw the light was off of her no at first Adam started to walk away Adam before he could cry to God Eve cried to him and through that silken cord of affection that, that human affection through that human affection you see, it's the ones that we are closest to, brothers and sisters. 
she says. It could be parental. It could be your mother. She says it could be filial. That's a brother or a sister. She says it could be conjugal. Or it could just be social. An old friend. The devil gets you to have an affection for somebody who doesn't love Jesus. Now listen, we're to go out and try and save everybody. But we are not to socialize on a level with people without having God's express command go there. We are not to place ourselves. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 3, Revelation 3, turn with me there and notice what the Bible says. Listen, what I'm trying to say tonight is we better get ready. We better change our attitudes. And I praise God because there's hope for me or God wouldn't have me say we. Don't you think God isn't talking to me too? God says we. And you remember the other night when we dealt with Moses, when he couldn't say we, remember? When he went up back on that mount, remember Tuesday night? Have mercy, the Holy Spirit sure fell that night. And Moses said, they, they, they. But you see, Daniel, when he prays, he said, Lord, we have sinned. We have sinned. He identified with the people, but also he was not in a position where he could say he wasn't a part of it. But Moses had just come out of the presence of God 40 days in the direct presence of God. If he had sinned, he would have ceased to live. So when he came down off the mountain, there was no way he could identify with being a part of that. He said, we, we, no, he said they. But tonight I say we, because the Holy Spirit said we. We better get it together, brothers and sisters. We better quit focusing so much on all of our children and our families and not focusing enough on ourselves. And we better ask God to put us in a place, in a position that is as favorable as possible because the fight's going to come. It's going to happen. That's what the Bible says. Listen to what it says in Revelation, Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3. The Bible says, beginning with verse 3, remember therefore how's that, how that, how that has, no, that's not the verse I'm looking for. Rev, Revelation 3 verse 10. Because thou hast kept, Father, thank you for the Holy Spirit. Breathe on us, Lord. Please breathe on us. Please. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So God says that the hour is going to come, but that's not the verse. Let me give you another one. Go with me to 1 Peter. God says the time's going to come, brothers and sisters. And he says, if we would keep the word of his patience, that he would keep us. Listen to what it says in 2 Peter chapter 2. Notice what it says in 2 Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2. The Bible says, now watch this. It says, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust until the day of judgment to be punished. In other words, God knows how to deliver you out when that hour comes. But God's not telling you to put yourself in that position. And even now, I know it's tough. But brothers and sisters, salvation comes when we surrender everything. Let me read this quotation and then I'm going to bring this to a close. On your paper, the second paragraph says, Father in heaven, you have definitely spoken to me tonight. I pray that as we close this meeting tonight, that your Holy Spirit would not allow us to ever 
leave this sobering position. You have awakened us. And tonight, we thank you. Please pour out more of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. It is the privilege of every soul to reach the highest standard. Stop at no low standard in your experience. Beware of admitting any worldly or selfish motives, whatever in the settlement of the great question between God and your soul. The Lord requires all that there is of you through constant, what brothers and sisters? Improvement of every talent that you make, that you may make a success in the formation of Christian character. By faith, let the Holy Spirit instruct you that you may not only receive, but impart the heavenly grace. All is to be surrendered to Christ. There must be no reservation. God expects more of us than we give him. It is an insult to Jehovah to claim to be Christians and yet speak and act as worldlings. Heavenly Father, please forgive me. Please, Lord, help. Please, tonight, give me victory over self. Give my brothers and sisters victory over self. I beg you, let us look peculiar. Let people call us weird. But please let us truly reflect your character and your love. I beg you for help right now. In the name of Jesus, please help. Please awaken us tonight. All is to be surrendered to Christ. There must be no reservation. God expects more of us than we give him. It is an insult to Jehovah to claim to be Christians and yet speak and act as worldlings. We cannot yield the smallest place to worldly policy. We need to be sanctified every hour through the belief of the truth. It is not safe for one day to neglect putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. We can make no compromise. We want not to make extra efforts for a more tasteful development of Christianity. We want Christ's form within the hope of glory. Catch the divine rays of light from Christ and you need not try to shine for you will reflect his image which is formed within. You cannot help shining. Others will see the Christ side of the character revealed. There is a great deal of rough work to do, but the grace of Christ will be revealed in spirit, in speech, in experience. The salvation of souls is the grand object to be kept before us, and mental and spiritual improvement will be seen in all our ways habits, and practices. When we start winning souls, it says that if, when our focus is on winning others, development is going on, brothers and sisters. That's what it says. They will be fragrant with the atmosphere which surrounds Jesus Christ. We will all have now and ever have had, we all have now and ever have had the sympathies of the divine intelligences. Heavenly beings cooperate with us in the battle as we advance against fallen angels and fallen men to press the battle into new territories, even where Satan's seat is. Young men who have little experience in the self-denial that Christ practiced will be constantly urging the necessity of a more tasteful development of Christianity than we are wont to meet with even among those who have long known the truth. I agree that there is need of sanctified refinement. There is need of an emptying of self and of an opening of the heart to an abiding Christ. 
but my heart has been much pained by the introduction among us of certain forms that ape worldly customs and fashions. In connection with the most precious sentiments of truth, there is brought in an outside, in an outside polish, a regard for that which is called taste, which has little of the true element, which works by love and sanctifies the soul. The, that quality of refinement, which is but an outside polish, and which is esteemed by the world is of little value with God. In everyday life, we must have an abiding Christ who is working constantly to conform all our attributes to the image of the divine. That surface religion talked of so glibly by the tongue that prates of the beautiful, I have learned the value of to my sorrow. Many who with flippant words are ever ready to speak of elevation and refinement do not act as though they had any practical knowledge of that which their tongues express. The poetical religion is not the religion that will stand the test of trial. I have learned that my sorrow, I have learned to my sorrow that they have little respect for true Christ-like piety little desire for the sanctification of the Spirit of God unto true holiness. To exalt a theory which will exalt self is their great ambition. To conform to the divine plan does not suit their frothy ideas. Oh, what deceptions are upon those who are looking for the beautiful and poetic in their speculations. Brothers and sisters, I want to read this last statement over. All, that's the third paragraph. We can read the rest when we go home, but I want to read this last thing, and I want us to read it prayerfully. All is to be surrendered to Christ. There is to be no reservation. God expects more of us than we give him. It is an insult to God or Jehovah to claim to be Christians and yet speak and act as worldlings. We cannot yield the smallest place to worldly policy. We need to be sanctified every hour through the belief of the truth. It is not safe for one day to neglect putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot make, we can make no compromise. We want not to make extra efforts for more tasteful development of Christianity. We want Christ's form within the hope of glory. Catch the divine rays of light from Christ, and you need not try to shine, for you will reflect his image, which is formed within. You cannot help shining. Others will see the Christ side of the character revealed. There is a great deal of rough work to do, but the grace of Christ will be revealed in spirit, in speech, in experience. The salvation of souls is the grand object to be kept before us, and mental and spiritual improvement will be seen in all our ways, habits, and practices. They will be fragrant with the atmosphere which surrounds Jesus Christ. We all have now and ever have had the sympathies of the divine intelligences. Heavenly beings cooperate with us in the battle as we advance against fallen angels and fallen men to press the battle into new territories, even where Satan's seed is. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come. And there's no more to be said tonight. You have already said it. We need to give you our all. Many of us are hanging on to life by the very tips of our fingers. And we need your help tonight. Don't allow probation to close on us while there's something in our hearts that we love, admire, and choose above Christ. As your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, brothers and sisters, we are living in the antitypical day of atonement. That simply means that the final judgment 
of God is taking place. We don't know when our names will fall on the lips of Christ. The time will come when your life and your choices and decisions as they have been will come before Christ. There is a climatic time where all ends with you. Where a final decision for your destiny, not the final decision of what will take place in the judgment. For if when your name comes to the lips of Christ, if the words found wanting are seen, you are not lost only, but at that time, even if you die, your record is not closed until everybody you have influenced for evil dies. Because in the judgment, we are judged by our influence with its far-reaching effects. We don't know when our name will come up. We just don't know. As I was driving on Thanksgiving Day, somebody's name came up because I heard on the radio, beware on this highway. There was a fatality. There was an accident. And I remember one of the sisters in the car with us said, mm, mm. It wasn't a word, it was a grunt. Because the reality of somebody never ever being able to see their family members. The reality of someone who was going with joy to eat a meal had died. Did they know Christ? Had they chosen him above all earthly desire? Had they surrendered to his ways? Or did they die wanting? When our names come up, that's it. When our names come up, that's it. Tonight, choose life. Choose life tonight. Ask God, Lord, help me. Help me, Lord. Jesus says, I am the way. But then Proverbs says in Proverbs 16, there's a way that's not of Christ. So there's a way that seems right unto a man. There's a way that looks like it's going to be okay. That's when we start rationalizing and we start trying to do it ourselves. And we place ourselves in positions that God is not placing us. They said there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death destruction damnation tonight I want to follow the way of Christ tonight I want to give him my heart I want to ask God to let the axe hit the root hit the root Lord I want the axe to hit the root Go to the bottom of it tonight and free me from myself. Is that your prayer? Is that your desire tonight? Do you want to be free? If that's your heartfelt desire tonight, just say no to sin. Stop right where you are. Don't go another step in that direction. The Lord will save you. Tonight, those rays want to fall. Would you like them to fall on you? If that's your prayer and that's your desire, I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet as we close in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you 
And we're asking that you would come and repair. Repair our hearts and our minds. Where we have allowed various obstacles to be placed in the way that have obstructed us from the path that we once were walking so smoothly. Lord, it used to be easy and a joy to open your word and just read it. We used to hate to put it down, but now it takes effort. We enjoy it when we are reading, but it takes effort. The hunger, the thirst is not there like it used to be. Free us tonight and give us a new spirit and a new heart. Give us the power not only to say no, but help us to dislike sin. Help us to love righteousness and keep us, Lord. Please keep us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you be seated for a moment of meditation?